Dallas police say a Wilmer Hutchins High School student shot another student on campus today. That shooting happened inside a classroom, even though the school in southeast Dallas has metal detectors at entrances. Dallas ISD says a teacher intervened to prevent more potential injuries by directing the 17-year-old gunman out of the building. Fox Sports' Peyton Yeager takes a look at the timeline of the response to the shooting. Peyton. Heather and a 17 year old who is facing a felony is treated as an adult and usually has their name and their mugshot released. We are still waiting for both of those pieces of information this evening. We do not know the identity of the 17 year old gunman, but when those first 911 calls came in um, from the high school, there was some confusion here outside in the parking lot. Students were inside calling their parents, telling them they were on lockdown. It was a frantic scene outside of Dallas ISD High School on Friday. Police say a 17 year old student was taken into custody after shooting a 17 year old classmate inside Wilmer Hutchins High. I didn't know how many people it was that was in the school with guns. The campus near I-20 and J.J. Lemon Road was flooded with first responders, including Dallas ISD police, Dallas police, Hutchins police and Dallas Fire Rescue. This is really, really crazy because this is an old school of mine. I, I used to go to school here. Around 1030 a.m., law enforcement responded to an active shooter call. Once officers entered the building, they learned this was an isolated shooting between the gunman and the victim. We did have a student shot today in the leg in a classroom setting by another student. The district says after the student was shot, a teacher was able to direct the gunman out of the building. The 17 year old suspect was taken into custody near the football field. A motive is still unknown, but there's no indication from police that the shooter was after more than just the one student. We think it's between those two students, but we'll find out. Dallas ISD Superintendent Dr. Stephanie Elizalde says the teenage victim will survive. And it is a non-life-threatening injury. That should never be a normal statement that should come from a superintendent. To know that he's okay, and it's a, it's a great relief. Meanwhile, parents waited on the perimeter to be reunited with their children, like Sharon Coleman and her son, Deshaun. They said they would shoot, so a bullet can go anywhere. You know, a bullet don't have no name on it. The most pressing questions from parents, where were the campus security failures that allowed a teenager to bring a gun into the high school? Metal detectives, wands, police, security, but yet a gun is in that school. The district confirms Wilmer Hutchins High has metal detectors. Dallas ISD also has a new policy this year requiring clear backpacks. We know that there are vulnerabilities. There are so many entrances to schools. Um, so that's one of the areas that the chief will be working with the school to identify those vulnerabilities. A 10th grader told reporters, some days the searches are not as thorough as they should be. They just literally open our backpack like this. They literally just do like this and they don't even check them all the way through. And we know this evening that a handgun was found inside the school earlier today when that investigation was going on. Now, the investigation also is ongoing for how the gun made its way into the school. The district says it will now review surveillance video and see where they may need to change other protocols. Heather? All right, lots to figure out. Peyton, thank you. And we will continue to bring you the very latest on this story on air and online. Just go to fox4news.com. Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver Rasheed Rice was reportedly going 119 miles an hour in supercar moments before a chain reaction crash in Dallas. That new information surfaced in an arrest affidavit one day after Rice turned himself in. Police say the driver of the second supercar that caused the crash, SMU cornerback Teddy Knox, turned himself in today. Fox Sports Blake Hansen live with the developments. Blake. Yeah, Heather, the d affidavit describes the drivers as both making multiple aggressive maneuvers through dense traffic before that chain reaction crash. Both drivers who police say were speeding before causing this chain reaction crash along the Central Expressway last month have now turned themselves in. Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver Rashi Rice booked Thursday 
Current SMU cornerback Teddy Knox booked Friday. An arrest warrant affidavit obtained by Fox 4 says the Lamborghini SUV Rice was driving was traveling 119 miles per hour seconds before the collision. The Corvette Knox was driving was traveling 116 miles per hour but slowed to 91 about a second before the crash. The speed limit on that stretch of the expressway is 70. Mark Lenahan is representing one of the victims. He told me Friday in his quarter century practicing law, he didn't expect to be surprised by details. But I was wrong. 119 miles per hour and 116 miles per hour is completely shocking for that highway on the evening before Easter. TMZ photos from that day showed everyone in the Lamborghini and Corvette walking away from the scene despite there being people injured in the other vehicles. Rice has not spoken on camera since the crash, but his attorney said he plans to make things right. He's going to do everything in his power to bring their life back to as normal as possible uh, in terms of injuries, in terms of property damage. He'll make certain that he is responsible for helping them to get through that particular part of this. Multiple people were injured in the crash, one seriously, according to the affidavit. That driver needed multiple stitches and has significant post-concussion symptoms. The affidavit says she'll be rendered to a life of limited mobility and sight for an undetermined extended period of time. Both Rice and Knox are charged with aggravated assault and collision causing serious bodily injury, among other charges. We spoke to George Milner this week, a defense attorney not involved in the case. The fact that they filed eight felony warrants is unusual. And that, to me, as a lawyer with three decades doing this, uh, that, that sends a message. I would interpret that as DPD is going to take a hardline stance on this. The affidavit says both Rice and Knox failed to check on others as they walked away from the scene. It notes that Rice did meet with detectives, but it doesn't say whether Rice offered any explanation for why he left the scene. The Chiefs have not commented on Rice's status. SMU football, meanwhile, suspended Knox yesterday. Fort Worth police are looking for six people they say are connected to a shooting in a popular entertainment district last month. So that includes one person they're naming a witness who may have recorded the shooting. Fox News Amelia Jones live in Fort Worth with a story. Amelia. Heather, Fort Worth police want to talk to five people, all of whom they're calling suspects, to figure out exactly what their actions were during the shooting. Police also say a witness might have recorded the whole thing, so police are also looking to speak to that man, too. Tuesday, Fort Worth police released images of six people they want to identify in connection to a shooting near the West 7th Entertainment District on March 17th. Detectives believe it started as an argument and a physical fight, which escalated to a shooting. Of the five suspects police are looking for, only one is identified as the shooter. This man in a black Nike shirt. He's seen holding a gun in the photo. Police say a woman in a black shirt and a man in a yellow shirt were involved in the fight that led up to the shooting. Police say two others, a woman in a gray Bucky shirt and a man in a gray hoodie, are considered observers. It's unclear why police are also considering the two observers as suspects in the shooting. We would like to talk to them to see what their actions were during the time of the incident. Fort Worth police say the victim is cooperating with investigators, but they couldn't confirm whether the victim and the five suspects knew each other. They also didn't say what started the fight that led up to the shooting. Well, we know that there was a, a fight or an argument prior to the assault where the victim was assaulted by these five suspects. However, it is important to talk to each one of them and get their side of the story. Fort Worth police would also like to hear from a sixth person. In the public post, police included the photo of a man in a black jacket who they say witnessed the incident and possibly recorded it. Whoever has either video, uh, either photos on their cell phones or any other type of uh, important information for this case, uh, that's uh, we're reaching out to them. Officer Daniel Segura says asking for the public's help does turn leads for investigations. You'd be surprised how many people either follow us on social media 
and how many people now that they see images or videos, they go, oh yeah, I, I know that person. Police are hoping that's the exact response the post gathers. That post with the photos, it's been shared more than 900 times on Facebook. If you recognize any of the five suspects or the sixth person, the witness, you're asked to contact Fort Worth Police. A 65-year-old hammer attack victim says that he was ambushed while in a convenience store. The victim suffered injuries to his hands and to his head. Police say 26-year-old Charles Murray committed the attack there and another attack on a dart train. Fox 4's David Centendry spoke with the victim. Joins us now from Plano. David. Yeah, the 65-year-old man was buying a lottery ticket from inside this gas station behind me. He decided to use the restroom, and it was while he was inside of that restroom that he was randomly attacked by a man with a hammer. I took one step back. I heard the stall door open, then all of a sudden I felt something hit me in the back of the head. A 65-year-old man recalls randomly being repeatedly struck in the head with a hammer while using a restroom inside a racetrack off Coit Road in Plano Tuesday evening. And then it happened again. And I guess my instinct was to raise my right hand to protect myself from whatever it was. And there was another blow, and I went to the ground. Eric, who does not want us to use his last name, says he screamed for help. The attacker ran off. Couldn't have been more than 30, 45 seconds. I mean, it was bam, bam, bam. And less than a minute, did he say anything to you? The only thing, the only thing I remember him saying was, uh, watch it now, watch it now. On Thursday, Plano PD charged Charles Maurice Murray for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. One of Murray's relatives saw surveillance images on Fox 4. That led to a 911 call. I was watching the news and I happened to call my mother and told my mother that I saw him on the news and she was like, he was right here. So I was like, well, just ask him, is he going around, you know, hitting people with hammers, you know? And he said he was and he didn't know why he did it. He's very unstable in the head and he needs his help. He needs his medication. Dart says the 26-year-old is also expected to face a charge in a random hammer attack which seriously injured a person while riding the orange line as it was pulling into the Lover's Lane station in Dallas hours before the attack at racetrack. I consider myself to be a Christian, so you have to forgive him. Forgiveness, but with repercussions. Eric has two broken bones in his right hand and five staples in the back of his head where the hammer connected. But, you know, I'm standing here. How much worse could this have been? Do you feel fortunate to just be standing here? Oh, I could, I'm, it's literally a miracle I'm alive. You know, I can't imagine for what happened to me that this could have gone any better. Murray remains in Collin County Jail on a $30,000 bond. We are still waiting for that formal charge to come on that different assault case from DART PD, but DART says that charge will be coming. In the IV bag tampering trial, a jury has found Dr. Reynaldo Ortiz guilty of all 10 counts. After the verdict, the U.S. Attorney's Office released a new video of Dr. Ortiz that was shown to the jury. Fox News' Lori Brown was in the courtroom all nine days and joins us now live. Lori. Heather, the jury reached the guilty verdict after about seven hours of deliberations. Cameras are not allowed in the federal court building, but I can tell you when the verdict was read, Dr. Ortiz was wearing a mask and he showed no emotion or reaction to the verdict. It's, it's almost like you have so many so many emotions, you you can't even sift them out. They're, it, you, you get flooded. John Caspar's wife, Dr. Melanie Caspar, is one of the victims of Dr. Reynaldo Ortiz's IV bags. Prosecutors say he turned IV bags into poison bombs that exploded on unsuspecting people. I don't think he ever looked me in the eye. Dr. Caspar died after treating herself with one of the IV bags at home when she was sick. In the trial, John Caspar testified how he tried to revive her with CPR before paramedics arrived, but was unable to. She went her whole life not being the center of attention. She was an anesthesiologist. She, she worked behind the, the drape in the operating room. 
Kaspar said one of the most difficult moments of the trial was seeing this newly released surveillance video of Dr. Ortiz filling up large syringes with a mix of different drugs. He then put the syringes in his pockets. The video was taken the day before 18-year-old Jack Adlerstein received one of the tainted IV bags. His doctors testified he nearly died on the operating room table. Him filling up the syringes in the uh, the pre-op room was was a difficult. You know, you can you can transpose what he's doing to Jack that day to to my wife and. You know, it's, it's, it's tough to see. Kaspar said the past two years have been a struggle without his wife. Time stops. Uh, you know, you've, if you're lucky, you've got a lot of friends and they can shove you along. Um, I've had many good friends and they've, they've done exactly, you know, what was required of them. Um, so I thank them all. Every last one of them. Between May and August, there were 13 patients who experienced similar unexplained cardiac emergencies. Prosecutors only charged Ortiz with causing serious bodily injury to four patients in August. That's because those are the patients they could tie Ortiz to through the surveillance video. The director of the Surgical Care Center testified the cameras had only been installed in May after a break-in. I'd like to give a, a, a thank you to whoever was breaking into the surgical centers so that they could install the, the security cameras um, because they wouldn't have existed otherwise. Kaspar said he is thankful Ortiz will no longer have access to patients. Get to know your anesthesiologist. Uh, it's an important question. You know, they're the ones keeping you alive on the table while, while the doctor is doing their, the surgeon is doing their business. In federal court, the sentencing process takes time. The judge will likely determine Ortiz's sentence in two to three months. He faces a maximum of life in prison.